Alrighty, yo, what is going on, everybody? It's your boy, Mr. DDG94. You're back with another reaction video. Today, we're going to react to Kobe vs. Shaq Part 3. This is by Secret Base. Without further ado, let's get right into it. Part 3, this should be the finale. You might not know this man's name, but you probably recognize him. Yeah. You've seen him here and here okay. and here. We could do this for a while. This is Jim Gray, a sports reporter in every sense of the word. Gray has had the determination to pursue tough and unwilling subjects, the good fortune to witness historic events, and the access to interview athletes within their locker rooms, press rooms, and fields of play. Access, if played right, begets another form of sports reporting. Alongside all the stories Gray got by digging and prying is a long list of stories for which the subject pursued him. Mike Tyson wrote to Gray from prison. LeBron James chose Gray to host his Decision TV special. Tom Brady started a podcast with Gray. Hmm. This is trust. Throughout a multi-decade, multi-Hall of Fame career, Gray has been trusted as the confidant and the medium for titanic sports figures who want the world to know something. Gray's autobiography, Talking to Goats, boasts his relationship with a stacked roster of greatest of all time athletes who trust him. Damn. One of these relationships was particularly special. Gray worked for the San Diego Clippers in the early 80s when Joe Jellybean Bryant was on the team. He met Joe's son when the kid was still in diapers. So Gray knew to keep an eye on Kobe Bryant during his rise to stardom. Once Bryant got there, his pre-existing connection with Gray led to access and trust. One of Kobe's first big national TV interviews as a pro, Jim Gray. That 2001 interview to discuss Kobe's mid-season conflict with Shaq, Jim Gray. Kobe's interview immediately after the Lakers won it all again that year, Gray. And after the Lakers were eliminated in the spring of 2003, who got the exclusive story that Kobe intended to become a free agent after one more season? Yes, Jim Gray. So it's no surprise that this reporter played a part in the other major stories of Bryant's 03 offseason. Let's be clear that these stories overlap, but they are not proportionate. One of the stories is important. In the summer of 2003, while visiting Colorado for a knee operation, Kobe Bryant was arrested and charged with the sexual assault of a 19-year-old hotel employee. On that July 18th, lying. the day Bryant was formally charged... Remember, y'all, that bitch was lying. That bitch lied on that man's name. He ain't do nothing to that woman. She let him, she let him fuck. She was a hoe. Her friends even came out against her and said she was a hoe. If you know, you know. I ain't got to go no further, but Kobe was innocent, man. Let that man rest in peace. I understand this is for, I understand this is a different time for, for this video. This is a different time, different topic. It's not really, it's not really the main focus. It's just a time and event that, um, God, I hate when niggas got to blast they fucking music, man. Got to be so fucking ignorant, dog. But yeah, um, I understand this ain't got really a lot to do with the main plot of the video, but I'm still... I just want to point it out there that he did not rape that woman. She lied. She was a hoe. That's what she did. Her friends even came out and admitted it. She ain't shit. And remember that. Kobe did not rape that woman. She allowed... She she It was consensual. The fuck? CNN called Jim Gregg. Live on air, Gray vouched for Bryant's character. Then he reported from the news conference in which Bryant, sitting beside his wife Vanessa and his attorneys, denied the charges but admitted to adultery. The criminal case was dismissed over a year later and a civil lawsuit settled thereafter. This is the important Kobe Bryant story from this era. It's real life. 
Jeff Perlman's book, Three Ring Circus, reviews the whole story. We are here to talk about something relatively unimportant. Sports. Work beef between Bryant and Shaquille O'Neal. This story was influenced by the big real-life one. And again, Jim Gray played a part in its telling. In August of 2003, Bryant told Lakers GM Mitch Kupchak that he hadn't received any support from his co-star after the allegations. Kupchak replied, and Shaq later confirmed, that O'Neal's bodyguard, Jerome, left Kobe messages on his behalf. Kobe said messages weren't enough, and according to coach Phil Jackson, also said that the moment Shaq started talking to the press, he would fire back. Shaq, meanwhile, was hearing of something the rest of the world would learn much later. During Kobe's initial interrogation with detectives, he made an offhand comment that he should have done what Shaq does. Shaq, he said, pays women up to a million dollars not to say anything. Shaq heard all this around the same time he was hoping to get a big contract extension from the Lakers, an extension that seemed increasingly unlikely as September turned to October. And that's when the league and the media turned on Kobe. That's exactly when I think the league and the media turned on Kobe because the league, the, the, believe it or not, the media was still on Kobe Dick for quite some time. But after Shaq left the Lakers and they weren't a dynamic duo no more, um, the league, the players, some of the players, not all of them, but a majority of the players and uh, – the media, they started to turn on Kobe around this time. This is when the ball hog thing became, rele- became uh, relevant. This is when uh, he's a shot chucker. He's a bad shot taker. All this negative stuff around him started happening. They started throwing this man under the bus. They started throwing Kobe under the bus around this time. Players didn't really fuck with him like that. They they was all taking Shaq side and stuff like that. Like, yeah, it was... It, it was it was just bad time, bro. R.P. to the Mamba, though. They respect his ass now. Oh, they respect his ass now. But back then, around this time, everybody had something to say. Everybody was against um, Kobe around this time. Kobe's impending free agency had something to do with that. So there is the backdrop for the last chapter of our story. The month-long climax of the Shaq-Kobe beef. October 2003. On Thursday, October 2nd, Lakers vets flew to Honolulu to join their younger teammates for training camp. Among them were two very important newcomers. Fresh off LA's first playoff defeat of the century, Shaq had recruited a couple fading legends hoping to grab a ring before they retired. Gary Payton and Carl Malone, huge new cogs in a very different Lakers roster that would need time to gel. Kobe Bryant didn't join his teammates for that first day of camp on Friday in Honolulu. Everyone knew about his court case and about his knee rehab, but it wasn't that. Kobe just said he was under the weather. Reporters asked Shaq how it felt to open camp without the full team present. The full team is here, said Shaq. Wait, what about Kobe? Here's what Shaq had to say about his teammates' absence. Meow, meow, meow. Are you disappointed that Kobe wasn't bonding with his teammates? Are you angry at Kobe? Shaq's protocol for questions about his teammate was cat. Can't answer that. On Saturday, Kobe finally showed up in Honolulu to join his teammates and face the media. Sunday, Phil Jackson canceled Lakers practice for some team bonding. While the Lakers ran around playing paintball at an Air Force station, Shaq mostly sniped from a stationary position. He was nursing a bruised heel, but Kobe said Shaq was in the back eating a slushie or something. This is all in good fun, but Shaq's foot issues and his related desire for a contract extension were no joke to him. He made that clear during exhibition play in Honolulu, barking directly at Lakers owner Jerry Buss. Two days later, the Lakers flew from Hawaii back to LA. Aboard the plane, Shaq busted out a portable turntable and speakers, with which he produced and then played 
a parody of the 50 Cent song P.I.M.P. with lyrics about Kobe's case. Kobe didn't witness that. He was headed to Colorado for court proceedings. Kobe rejoined his teammates for media day on Friday. He said the back and forth for court was no big deal. Shaq said he wasn't paying attention to the case. The only TV he watched was SpongeBob. He wasn't going to comment or speculate. He just wanted to be a source of relaxation for Bryant, to help him laugh, to be his pillow, his comforter. When the Lakers headed to San Diego for an exhibition against the Phoenix Suns, Kobe was absent again. His knee was bothering him, and he had to jet off to Colorado anyway. Shaq didn't play in that game either because of his heel, but he spoke, and not like a cat. Asked why he kept resting, Shaq said he wanted to be right for Derek Fisher, Carl Malone, and Gary Payton. Reporters noted he was forgetting someone. Nope, he repeated the same list verbatim. Derek, Carl, Gary. No mention of Kobe. The following week, Kobe and Shaq finally played preseason together. Kobe made his debut in Anaheim, then played again in the Lakers' exhibition finale against the Kings in Las Vegas. The crowds in those two neutral locations were loud in their support for Kobe, the player and the person. But the player was clearly still shaking off the post-surgery rust. He shot just seven for 24 over those last two exhibition games. After watching that performance, Shaq shared a familiar sentiment in a familiar venue. Instead of speaking to Kobe, he spoke about Kobe to the media assembled in Vegas. If Kobe's going to be on the court, he needs to keep other people involved, be more of a passer. That was the last day of preseason, Friday, October 24th. Kobe had said he would fire back the moment Shaq spoke out. Sunday, reporters visited Lakers practice two days before their season opener. Here's what they found. Beef. Kobe kept his word. Responding to that relatively tame suggestion that he pass more, Kobe said, I'm not changing my game. I take good shots. I know how to play my position. You worry about yours. Teammates overheard Kobe saying he would opt out the next summer and leave, all because of Shaq. When Shaq got wind of this escalation, he stopped being tame. We're not talking about positions. We're talking about team basketball. If it's going to be my team, then that's my opinion. Don't like it, then leave. I don't care what Kobe does. He doesn't care what we do. That's the type of person he is. Shaq chastised Kobe for skipping team functions and for not traveling with the Lakers. He said he was taking control of the Lakers, but noted the media might rather give that control to Kobe, just like they give him everything. That, right before the season starts, is a lot. But Shaq also said, as he had in the past, that beef wouldn't affect the actual basketball the Lakers had to start playing in 48 hours. Speaking of actual basketball, Kobe mentioned a specific stretch of the prior season, one that's worth recalling to understand what comes next. One big reason 0203 was so disappointing was Shaq's health. He delayed long-needed foot surgery until right before the season began. O'Neal missed a lot of games, a lot of losses while rehabbing, and then struggled to play his way into shape. Shaq did not apologize for the inconvenience. He had been injured on company time, so he'd recover on company time. He'd rather miss part of the season than rehab during his vacation. During a stretch of February 03, when Shaq was hobbling and sometimes absent, Phil gave Kobe an explicit green light to take over the offense. So Kobe floored it. 46, 42, 51, 44, 40, 52, 40, 40, 41. Bryant scored 40 or more points in nine straight games tying the best such streak of Michael Jordan's career. Only Michael and Wilt Chamberlain had recorded such a feat. The moment Shaq and Phil allowed space for him to do so, the 24-year-old Kobe proved he could make baskets on par with the greatest scorers to ever walk the earth. And then he stopped, ostensibly on purpose. 
Here, according to Kobe many years later, is what followed. Shaq comes back from injury and Phil goes, you know, I still continue to do it, right? And then Phil calls me to his office, goes, hey, you know, we're starting to lose the big fella. What do you mean? Well, he's not getting the attention. You know, this this 40 point streak is starting to kind of take away his fire Mm. to prove something, right? So I need you to start dialing it back. I'm like, what? (laughs) He says, we're going to lose him and we need him in June. Okay. All right. We have a game against the Clippers. I think I like 38 or something like that. And I had a chance to score 40 and to get 40 again. It was a blowout game. I dumped the ball in the shack instead of shooting a wide open shot. The 40 point streak ended that night. Wow. Now, Kobe's recollection fudges some details. He only had 32 points that night against the Clippers, and he kept shooting well into the fourth quarter. But it is absolutely true that when Kobe was riding that streak, Shaq sounded annoyed. I guess it's cool. And then, as usual, he whined. He wanted more shots. He name-dropped an old, inferior Jordan teammate. I'm not Bill Cartwright. I'm not a token big man. Bumfoot or not, I want the ball. Vintage Shaq stuff. It is also true that Phil responded by sort of rescinding the green light. And it is true that Kobe obeyed. In March and April 03, he passed much more while scoring merely a lot of points rather than the godlike 40 a game he had averaged in February. So, returning to October, this was what Kobe referred to in his response to Shaq's accusations of selfishness. Kobe was just following orders. The day all these quotes hit the papers, October 27th, Phil called a meeting to clear the air. Each of Shaq and Kobe said his piece. Phil demanded they keep everything in-house. Carl Malone begged them to just knock it off. The meeting adjourned. Maybe the air was indeed clear. That night, Kobe called Jim Gray. Gray was busy interviewing the governor of California about deadly wildfires, but Kobe wanted an interview. Gray published their conversation on ESPN that night. The air was not clear. Nearly every one of Kobe's answers fired a shot at Shaq. Fat, out of shape, over-dramatizing his foot injuries, not a leader, childlike, selfish, jealous, not my quote-unquote big brother. His unprofessionalism hurt us last year, and I don't want it to hurt us this year. That is an avalanche, and it's not even the full transcript. Kobe gave another quote about Shaq having less pride than the guy who makes donuts at 7-Eleven, but Gray cut it because he was worried it might wreck his relationship with Shaq. Suffice to say, the damage was done with or without that line. Shaq saw the interview that night. He told teammates he was going to kill Kobe. Immediately, Brian Shaw's phone started to ring. Shaq and Kobe's old teammate had just retired, but multiple Lakers made the same plea. Get to L.A. immediately. The next morning, Shaq says, he arrived at the practice facility to find Shaw waiting for him, along with Jerome and a few teammates. Kobe rolled in, sounding unimpressed by Shaq's threats, but Shaw insisted Shaq was not messing around. Everyone assembled in a theater room, and they got to screaming. Both Lakers PR guy John Black and O'Neal himself say Shaw at one point had to step in and prevent Shaq from going after Kobe. With Shaw as mediator, both guys restated their gripes. Current Lakers chimed in to explain how much this conflict hurt them. Shaq told Kobe if he ever said anything like that again, he'd kill him. Kobe responded, whatever the relationship looked worse than ever. Kobe received a team fine for the ESPN interview, then he told reporters he and Shaq were cool, past it, ready to move on. It's over. Shaq stonewalled those reporters for a couple days, saying they weren't on his level intelligence-wise. But then, after the first game of the season, Shaq spoke. At Phil's urging, O'Neal agreed to a truce. We have to move on. I'm boisterous. He's boisterous. Nothing personal. We're used to it. We need each other. Yin and yang. Opposites attract. That was October 31st. The month of beef had concluded. Back 
to basketball. On paper, the Lakers had a good 03-04 season. They started really hot, persevered through some injuries, and made it back to the NBA Finals. Between the lines, well, Phil wrote a whole book documenting that season's palace intrigue from his perspective. Phil and Kobe had to work through major problems with each other. Phil and Shaq, both awaiting contract extensions, stood united in their suspicion that the Lakers would prioritize Kobe's 04 free agency, and that Kobe would ultimately decide their fates. It was a reasonable suspicion, given the way Jerry Buss spoke about Kobe. And please don't forget, Kobe was awaiting trial for sexual assault this whole time. For a winning basketball season, 2003-2004 was extraordinarily strange away from the court. But between Shaq and Kobe, the season was pretty uneventful after October. Shaq says they kept a lid on stuff, which is mostly true. You know, give or take the odd ESPN article in which Shaq insisted he really did call Kobe over the summer, and if he had a problem with someone, he just punched him in the face instead of talking to the press, while Kobe replied, no, he didn't call me, and if he wants to fight, we can fight. Stuff like that. For real, though, the beef settled into a cold war. Shaq and Kobe made their feelings known in quiet, petty ways, like refusing to get taped by the same trainer. Phil Jackson, feeling closer than ever to the Shaq side of the divide, met with O'Neal and Rick Fox to ask whether they thought Kobe should leave the team to deal with his case. They both said no, but when Phil asked if they thought these Lakers would win a championship with Kobe, their answer was the same. And indeed, the Lakers did not. For the first time ever, Shaq and Kobe lost an NBA Finals together. And that 0-4 defeat to the Detroit Pistons included additional novelty. Kobe took more shots than Shaq did in an NBA Finals. It didn't go so hot. Bryant shot 10 of 27 in a surprise Game 1 loss at home. In a back-breaking Game 4, Kobe hit just 8 of 25. Shaq, who kept giving the Lakers more points on fewer attempts than his teammate, issued quotes that sounded like his old mid-season self. Write what you see. I'm disappointed. But Kobe kept shooting till the bitter end, 7 of 21 in the elimination defeat, while Shaq hit 7 of 13. Years later, 04 Laker Kareem Rush said he thought Kobe was gunning for the finals MVP trophy that had always been Shaq's. That obviously didn't come to pass, but Kobe had grander desires anyway. The Lakers dynasty was unmistakably over. Kobe had the negotiating power of free agency. The franchise seemed to favor him despite an ongoing criminal case. His demand was simple. Kobe wanted to make the baskets. And he was clear in 2004 about what that meant. He did not want to be a sidekick any longer. It would be him or Shaq, not both. At the time, Kobe said these things in private. But years later, Kobe opened up about how he felt in 04. He put it best in Rick Buecher's oral history of that Lakers season. I wasn't going to play with Shaq anymore. I'm going to show you fucks what I can do on my own, in LA or somewhere else. Kobe used his free agency to force the Lakers' hand. And if he was bluffing, well, this is a hell of a bluff. Whatever it was, it worked. Shaq had watched the Lakers punt his contract extension, then he watched them do the same to Phil Jackson. When news broke that Phil would quote-unquote retire, Shaq read the writing on the wall and asked for a trade. On July 14, 2004, he got it. The very next day, Kobe signed a seven-year, $136 million deal to stay with the Lakers. Damn. At long last, it was his team. So this is where Shaq's concept of work beef peels away. The work was over, and with it the associated conflict. It's one that Kobe summarized very tidily in 2004. You know, he used to get mad at me for not playing team basketball. He used to get mad at me because he wasn't in tip-top shape. 
Both men referred to their feud as the inevitable clash of two alpha dogs. Each wielded his own prideful ego. Shaq took pride in natural brilliance, in his ability to dominate opponents without practice. He wanted teammates to buy in and to get along with him. Kobe took pride in crafting brilliance, in obsessive practice to refine his individual game. He didn't care as much about buy-in or about being liked. For a time, Shaq's advantages in age, experience, and the system made him the prevailing force. Shaq spoke many words across many forms of media to check Kobe's individualism and get what he wanted, the ball and three championships. But when Shaq's fitness slipped, the undeniable fruits of Kobe's labor made him the prevailing force. He flexed his youth and his solo skill, and then he used the media his own way to target Shaq's foibles. It's not that Kobe didn't want those three rings, he just needed to prove that he could earn some as an unquestioned first option. In the long run, Kobe got what he wanted, baskets. Two more championships as the leading Laker. Two finals MVP trophies. One more ring without Shaq than Shaq managed without him. With that, and with the formal dismissal of his criminal case, Kobe cultivated a reputation, a legacy, and a brand, literally, that was about Kobe and Kobe alone. His excellence, his obsession, his precision, even his scandal. The whole Black Mamba thing began as a way for Nike to market Kobe after his sexual assault allegation. And it just evolved as he became a finals MVP, veteran legend, and retired public figure. It's a hell of a thing. And it overlaps with the denouement of our story. The Shaq-Kobe beef didn't just end sharply with their 2004 work breakup. Later that offseason, the public learned what Shaq already knew, that Kobe's 03 police interrogation included a statement accusing Shaq of paying off women. This response, issued in September through ESPN's Stephen A. Smith, was about as harsh and as direct as Shaq would ever get. Denial and distance, but also an unmistakable reference to the expensive ring Kobe had bought his wife Vanessa after the allegations came to light. Smith and John Saunders put Kobe on the spot, pressing on a guy who already felt plenty of pressure. When's the last time you talked to Shaq and did you ever apologize for those statements? This exposed Kobe's new position in the beef. He was done stoking it. After attempting some excuses, I can try to, I can try to track him down, but I, you know, I don't have his number or anything like that. He promised to apologize with Stephen A's help. Well, let me ask you this question. One of the things that Shaq would say, and, I, and I, I know him pretty well, is that Shaq would say, he's not hard to find. You probably got his number. I get it from you and I call him today. There's some irony here. It is funny that Smith would quote Shaq as being not hard to reach, because when Colleen Dominguez asked a similar question, O'Neal jokingly said the opposite. If Kobe Bryant called you on your cell phone right now, what would you say to him? I don't have a cell phone. Because people that I'm connected with, I'm connected with them. All you got to do is think, and I'll call you. I don't have a cell phone. And that's the problem with the diesel. I'm technologically more advanced than you are. But isn't that Shaq? With so much less pressure, so much less to prove, Shaq in 2004 sounded as glib and playful as ever talking about the beef. On SportsCenter, he made subtle digs at Kobe's style of play. I think if he did the little things, he'd be the greatest player to ever play the game. But he, he's a great player. What are the little things? Make everybody else better. Speaking to Stephen A., he made insinuations about Kobe's character. You don't have to like me. But most of the people, if you ask them about me, they really like me. So if you don't like me, there might be something wrong with you. And he told jokes, like the one about new co-star Dwayne Wade surprising him by passing him the ball. After he and Wade won the 2006 championship, Shaq enjoyed a few years ahead of Kobe in the title ledger. It's probably not a coincidence that Shaq kept the beef in the public consciousness, always in a silly way. 
Kobe? Who is that? Yes, that is an actual scene from Scary Movie 2. What? This Bitch, ain't is no Scary the Movie 2, no Shaq. Story. After the work ended, the beef faded gradually into more of a meme than an open conflict. Each guy got what he wanted, got older, and got comfortable laughing about the past, at a distance, and eventually as friends. There's one particularly famous moment from this era of gradual detente. It happened in 2008, after Shaq's fourth title, but before Kobe won his fourth and fifth. In June 08, days after the Kobe-centric Lakers lost in the NBA Finals, Shaq got on stage at a club in New York and performed a freestyle rap largely directed at Kobe. Check it. You know how I be. Last week, Kobe couldn't do without me. One line stole the show, and it became a meme of its own. Okay, Kobe, tell me how my ass tastes. And listen, that makes sense. Kobe, how my ass taste is catchy. Shaq repeated it like a dozen times, and he got the whole crowd to join in. Kobe says he had a laugh at it, all in good fun. But here's the thing. While how my ass taste is funny in a vague, competitive, sports-focused way, this is something else. Kobe ratted me out. That's why I'm getting divorced. He said Shaq gave a bitch a meal. I don't do that because my name should kill. That is Shaq referencing Kobe's police interrogation and his well-known statement about Shaq therein. And it's Shaq suggesting that statement was responsible for his divorce, which was an actual thing that came to pass. That's real and pretty dark. Which is to say, not everything can just fade. Not everything can be laughed off. There were genuine regrets, real scars on both sides of this relationship. When Kobe went on Shaq's podcast in 2015, they voiced regret in two different forms. Shaq framed things the way he often does. He stoked the beef in front of media because it was business, because it was the heat of the moment, or in order to exert control. Shaq said a lot of stuff he didn't mean. Kobe, on the other hand, said a few things he did mean, things that came to make him feel like he was an idiot as a kid. By saying all this stuff to the media, they synthesized beef. They generated pressure. If 2004 was when Kobe realized he had to pull back from the public beef and apologize directly for the stuff he regretted, then Shaq's version of the same came a few years later. O'Neal and Bryant were teammates again for one night. On February 15th, 2009, they were both Western Conference All-Stars, Kobe still a Laker, Shaq with the Phoenix Suns. This was when the world first really saw Shaq and Kobe enjoying each other's company again. They practiced together, played together, had fun making baskets together even if the baskets didn't count. At game's end, Shaq and Kobe shared MVP honors, and Kobe told Shaq to give the trophy to his son, Sharif, at which point something clicked for the big guy. He was open and vulnerable about this in 2018. You told me to take the trophy home. That's right. Remember that? I did. And I took it home and I gave it to Sharif. Yeah. And I, and I realized then, I was like, I think I may have messed something up because a lot of times that our beef was going on, you know me, I'm the master marketer. Mm -hmm. About 60% of the time, I would just say it just to keep it going. Luckily, I won three out of four <laughs> with this guy, but I was a to this guy. So I, I owe you an apology. I'm going to give you an apology, but we ain't going to be doing all that crying. No. And all that <laughs> they did win three out of four. But because one or the other couldn't stay satisfied, and because that dissatisfaction went public, those three rings could have been relegated to a B story in the shared legacy of an all-time great sports partnership. All along, this was the solution. Shaq and Kobe were better off speaking to each other, not about each other. That didn't happen enough when they were teammates. It hurts to know it can't happen any longer, but it did happen. Because they spoke, because they resolved their differences in public, their shared legacy can look more like this. 
better measured in titles than in beef. Shaq and Kobe made mistakes in their relationship. They made demands. They made accusations. They made headlines. They made a mess. But when that was all behind them, they made up. And even as it happened, they made baskets. All righty. So yeah, that's just gonna about do it for this one, man. Shaq and Kobe, one of the most undeniable, most unstoppable duos I have ever seen throughout my time on, on this earth. Sad to know that one of the two are no longer here. Sadly, R.P. to Kobe, R.P. to Gigi, R.P. to all the passengers on that helicopter. And yeah, never get to see the fruits. Kobe would never get to see the fruits of his labor, man. That's the sad part, though. And he'll never get to share it with the people that he did it with, man. Sad. But anyway, so that's just going to about do it for this one. I'll see y'all in the next video. Till then, peace out.